Hi, welcome to lecture six of 3032 and 7079 EDN on the strand of biological sciences from the Australian Curriculum Science. So the learning objectives for this particular lecture are as, as you can see on the screen. So we're going to compare and contrast linnaean and phylogenetic classification. We're going to learn how to read and interpret food webs. You're going to be able to describe the major tenets of the cell theory and also the structure and function of a variety of human organ systems. Then we're going to have a look at explaining the homeostatic control of physiological processes and describe and explain Mendel's laws. Finally, we're going to finish on the idea which holds all of biology together, the theory of evolution by natural selection by Charles Darwin. But let's kick things off by looking at where we see these ideas within the curriculum. So in terms of planning this lecture, I looked at the Australian Curriculum for Science for years 7, 8, 9 and 10, and then I highlighted the pit key particular concepts which are, are written about in terms of the content descriptors, and then from that highlighting, I then identified the particular concepts that I need to cover in this lecture. Once I'd identified those concepts, I then wrote these learning objectives and then these learning objectives then form the basis of what was to go on each of the slides which corresponded to each of those ideas. So let's kick things off. So let's have a look at how taxonomy evolves. So taxonomy is a branch of science and essentially the science of placing living organisms into groups, into looking at the characteristics and deciding upon which organisms are more similar and which organisms are different. So if we go all the way back to when this endeavour first started, we can look at the classification system of Aristotle. Now growing up you might have played the game animal, vegetable or mineral, which is essentially a guessing game where somebody asks you yes or no questions and you reply the only answers you can give are yes and no. And the idea is to narrow it down to whether you are thinking about an animal, vegetable or mineral. Now, be, so when we just look at the animal and vegetable portion of this classification system developed by Aristotle, we kind of see things, are, that's where things begin to diverge. So for example, animals were classified as whether they had legs and roamed on the land, whether they could fly or whether they swam. So after we decided whether things were plants or animals, and if we decided something was an animal, we then based all future cla further classification on its type of locomotion, whether it walked, ran, hopped or slithered about, whether it flew or whether it actually swam. Then when we looked at plants, plants were classified as being small, medium or large. Now, that classification system was used for quite a long time until um, Carl Linnaeus came along and developed the system that we use today. So for example, we can see here that L Linnaeus, when he developed his system back in 1735, was very much inspired by Aristotle's system of classifying things into the vegetabalia, vegetabalia or animalia. So these are the Latin names for what we call today the plant kingdom and also the animal kingdom. Haeckel, another biologist, came along and actually said, well, actually there's more to life than just plants and animals. There are these microscopic living things that we can't actually see with the naked eye, that we could only see with a microscope. And he called these protista. Along came Chatton. He was the first one to use other cellular methods. And he described life as being either prokaryotic or eukaryotic, or falling into the um, categories of prokaryota and eukaryota. And this was essentially whether an organism, when you looked at its cells, had a nucleus or whether its DNA was just floating about in the cell. Copeland then came along and refined that model and said, well, okay, yes, there are prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but when we look at the eukaryotes, they can be divided into protista, plants and animals, because when we have a look at their cells, plant cells are more alike than animal cells, which are different to plant cells, and plant and animal cells are different again to the cells of protista.
and then all of the other microorganisms, the unicellular organisms, they classified as Monera. Well, that idea chopped and changed over the time. You can see that by this stage it was the 20th century um, until we ended up with a system that we are going to describe in this video and that is the system described by Woes. So where Linnaeus developed his system and he had the highest category as being kingdoms that, and he started with the plant and animal kingdom, well Woes came along and said, well actually there's a level beyond kingdom and that is domain. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about domains in a moment. So when we combine the Linnaean classification system with the Woes, both of them named Carl, we can actually see that it breaks down into the diagrams that you can see on the screen. So biology, we restrict ourselves to studying life. Okay? So the first thing is we need to decide whether the thing we're looking at is living or if it's non-living. If it is living, then it falls under the umbrella of our attention. If not, then it belongs to either chemistry, physics or geology, okay? one of those other domains. So once we've determined whether something's alive, then we break that into those three domains that we talked about earlier. Those are the uh, 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 bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. Okay? So they are the levels of domains. Underneath the domains, the domains are broken down into, five, into kingdoms. So for example, in the eukaryotic kingdom, that's broken down into the plant and animal kingdom and the protistan kingdom, so for example, and they're broken down further into phyla. Phyla are further broken down into classes, orders, family, genera, and species. So each time, as we proceed down that diagram, we're becoming much, much more specific about the category and the characteristics of the organisms which belong in that group. And actually, when we look at the word species, it has the same root word as specific, okay? So you can see that they're the two different representations of the classification system that we currently use. Now, another type of classification system out there is known as phylogenetic. And as the name implies, this relies upon using genetic differences as the basis of classification. Now, when we do this, we actually find that there's a lot of similarities, but there are some differences. There are a lot of similarities between Linnaean classification and also phylogenetic classification. When we look at a phylogenetic tree, for example, we're able to all go all the way back to what scientists refer as LUCA, or the last universal common ancestor. So you can see there in that particular phylogenetic tree that all life, according to this idea, all life sprang from this universal common ancestor, or LUCA, and from there branched off into the current species that we know of bacteria. So bacteria were, were the first branch to break off. Another branch went off in another direction, and that's where we got the Archaeans, or the ancient ones, as the name implies, and also us. So we belong in that Eukarya kingdom, and we are more related to Archaea than we are to bacteria. And this is where we get the idea of tree and life. In fact, that diagram that was on the title slide of this PowerPoint was the sketch that Darwin made about him thinking through his idea of evolution and the, that idea of the tree of life. Here are some other representations, a little bit more filled in than what we can see here. And what these are trying to do is represent the, the, the all life. So the diagram that you can see there on the left is examples of current living examples of the various branches of tree of life. Now, it's not quite possible to fit every single living thing, let alone everything that ever lived, but that's what that middle diagram has a go at doing. And when we look at older examples of trees of life, um, you can see there that that one on the right show is much more of that tree diagram, whereas that phylogenetic tree of life is much, much closer to reality. And the reason why we put it in a circular diagram like that is because otherwise it would just be too wide for the screen that, that we're using. Now, 
This is my particular favorite phylogenetic tree because it actually shows pretty much every living thing that was has ever lived. And it shows it from the beginning of time, which is represented by the center of that diagram, and moving out towards current times on the outside of that diagram. And you can see just how many uh, bacteria there are, how many eukaryotes there are, and the, the whole variety of life is represented quite beautifully in this single diagram. Okay. So let's go back and have a look at the domains. So remember how Carl Woese was the guy who came up with that level which is above kingdoms? Well, the way that we differentiate at the domain level is all at the cellular level. So none of it is actually at the organism level or even at the organ level. It's all down at the cells. So you need to have a look at the cells of bacteria, archaea and eukarya and that's what defines the differences between those three. So for example, bacteria are what we call prokaryotic cells. So the, these are the cells without a well-defined nucleus. However, if you looked at the cell of an archaean or a eukaryote, you'll definitely notice that we and archaea have a well-defined nucleus, unlike bacteria. When you have a look at the walls, you'll find that bacteria, they have a chemical called, or a molecule called peptidoglycan, whereas archaea don't have that particular type of uh, protein in their cell wall. And if they, if um, in, in eukaryotes, if we do have a cell wall, then we don't have that peptidoglycan. When we have a look at the cell membrane, that membrane which that surrounds our cells, well, we are uh, eukarya and um, uh, archaeans, we have ester links in our plasma mem membranes, whereas bacteria, they only have ester links between polar heads and the fatty acid tails. And there are two more differences there. So, a nice challenge for you, a nice way to get some active learning into this otherwise passive lecture is to draw a tri-Venn diagram and have a go at actually summarizing this particular text into the graphic organizer of the tri-Venn diagram. Okie dokie. Radio, let's go and have a look at the kingdom animalia in a little bit more detail. So when it comes to classifying animals, so so let's go all the way back to the start. So we've decided whether um, a thing is living, yeah? So uh, whether it's living or not living, that puts it into the field of biology. Then we need to decide by looking at its cells, whether it has a well-defined nucleus, whether it doesn't, um, whether it has pep peptidoglycans in the cell wall, and a whole ver other variety of cell-related phenomena. From that, then we, if we decide that what we're looking at is, is an animal based upon those cellular features, well then we use other criteria to break that down even further. So once we've decided that it is an animal, the f one of the first things that we decide is whether it has a backbone or not. From that one question, we can lump things into vertebrates such as us, things which have a backbone, so for example, reptiles and birds and amphibians and a range of other animals, or whether they don't have a backbone or whether they have an exoskeleton. And that exoskeleton can be a hard shell or it can just be skin, as in the case of worms. So the next level of classification is whether things have a backbone or not. Then we can use other criteria to then break down those groups even further. Now, this is a nice summary of vertebrates and invertebrates, one of the key first questions that we ask to break down the animals within the animal kingdom. However, when we look at reality, what we actually find is there's actually no group called invertebrates, whereas there is a group which all animals with a backbone or with a, uh, with a notochord as part of its um, development actually all go into one group. But when we have a look at the invertebrates, they're actually split um, even at the phyla level into a variety of groups. Okay? So this is the reality here. So you can see how all of those organisms all the way down the bottom
they actually belong to a single phyla of all animals which contain a backbone. And when you have a look at the, the class down there of um, amphibians and reptiles and birds and mammals, they all actually have a backbone. Whereas if you go all the way back up to phyla, you've got your flatworms and your roundworms and echinoderms and a whole range of other organisms, but they're all split up into separate phyla all the way back up there, whereas us animals with a backbone, we kind of kept in one group and we're only split into different groups much later down the classification system. Rightio, let's turn our attention to food webs and food chains. Now, a food web is a simplified diagram of the flow of energy through an ecosystem. So you can see an example of a food web in front of you here. Now, and it's showing how energy flows from one organism to another within this particular ecosystem. Now, the ultimate source of the energy for 99% of ecosystems in the world is the sun. So that's why pretty much all, well, all um, terrestrial ecosystems start off with either a plant or an algae. In this case, it's a plant. So the energy which is harvested by plants from the sun to create their own food, um, is th that energy is stored by the plant and then is then passed on to the next level. So we call these first order consumers or another classification system refers to them as herbivores. So they eat the plants, um, sorry, they eat the leaves, the fruit, the bark, um, the whole plant, for example, the stems, the roots are also eaten as well. So all those organisms, if they just eat um, plants, then they are what we call herbivores. Then those herbivores or first order consumers are then eaten by what we call second order consumers. And you might be able to see a pattern here. Second order consumers are eaten by third order consumers, fourth order and so forth up the chain. Okay. So the handy thing about a food web is that it can show us about the impacts about removing or introducing animals to an ecosystem, all by looking at how energy flows through an ecosystem and the eating relationships between these organisms. Okay? So for example, if we say uh, reduced, or if we went into an area and we killed all of the snakes in this particular environment, well, let's have a look at the impacts upon other organisms. Well, without the snakes around, you can definitely see how toads and predaceous insects, herbivorous insects, ex insectivorous birds, um, and seed-eating birds and mice, how all of their numbers will increase because all of a sudden, there aren't the snakes around to eat them. Okay? So there is one impact. So if those, so by removing the snakes, we're going to get explosions in all of its prey species, toad, predaceous insects, herbivorous insects, and so forth. Because we're going to get an overabundance of its prey species, so insects, birds, and frogs, and because they eat uh, plants, then we can expect there to be an impact upon the, the plant numbers. So by removing spider, uh, snakes, then we increase the numbers of birds and insects and toads. And by in, in, in increasing those, then we're going to decrease or impact negatively upon the plants within that ecosystem. So we can see how effects at the top of the food chain can tumble all the way down. And this is where we get the idea of trophic cascade. Now, trophic cascade is traditionally about that top down where you remove an apex species. So for example, apex species in this particular food web are the foxes, hawks, owls, and snakes. By removing one of those, they the, the effects of doing that ripple all the way down the food web and can impact upon plants, can impact upon organisms which you don't even think are remotely related to the organism which has been removed, but can have quite devastating consequences for the ecosystems 
um, and, and the organisms within that ecosystem. So here's a really, really fascinating case study that I encourage you to watch this video about the reintroduction of wolves to the Yellowstone National Park. And what I'd like you to do to really help you unpack and understand the concept of trophic cascade is have a go at drawing a flow diagram to represent the various impacts about numbers of organisms increasing, about numbers of organisms decreasing as a result of the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone Natural, National Park. Now, generally when we look at food webs such as this one here, these are generally what we call the green food webs. However, there exists another food web behind this, which we call the brown food web. Now, this is an extra concept, so it's not going to be examined, but it's highly recommended that you do have a look at this idea because it's just going to enrich your understanding of science and improve your ability to teach science in the classroom. Let's turn our study, uh, our, our focus now to the nitrogen cycle because when we have a look at food webs and food chains and, and animals moving around and plants eating animals and animals eating animals, well, this has impacts upon our, uh, on, on human use of the land. And what we can do is when we have a look at the nitrogen cycle, what we're really looking at is how that's, that nitrogen cycles through the ecosystem. So let's have a look at some case studies of how we as humans have actually over thousands of years studied the nitrogen cycle and figured out how things actually work and then inserting ourselves into that scenario to take advantage of that, that flow, that cycle of nutrients through the ecosystem. So one of the key ways that we've done this um, as humans is by fish farming. So we can have a look at some examples of some Australian indigenous examples and also we're going to have a look at a North American example. So for example, here in Australia, the, what you can see there is the, the Burl, Burrowarana fish traps in New South Wales. Now these are ancient structures from around 35,000 years ago or 30,000 years ago. So I can't remember um, quite the number now. But um, this was well before the pyramids were built. This was well before... Um, Stonehenge was built, we've dated this particular place back, uh, back to then. And what this shows is that Indigenous Australians understood the natural cycle of migration of particular types of fish and in particular eels as they moved um, from the freshwater uh, rivers and lakes within Australia out into the open ocean to do their fish thing and then eventually when it's time to breed again, then they all come back in. And a similar thing happens over in North America with the salmon. So the salmon are, are a fish as well. And they go, uh, once they're born, they head out into the open ocean. We kind of lose track of them as humans. They go out there and, f and, and, and eat and eat and eat. And once they're done, they, they come back to where they were born, or where they were spawned. Um, um, to mate and eventually contribute to the nitrogen cycle in those particular rainforests. Now, before humans came along and actually put these fish traps in and, and started the first salmon, salmon ceremony to celebrate the effect that, that fish were swimming up their streams, the purpose of these fish migrations were to move huge amounts of nutrients out from the open ocean back onto land. So as the fish, as the salmon, as the eels ate and ate and ate out in the, those open oceans, they would bring all of those nutrients in there as part of their body back to their spawning grounds. Once they uh, were able to mate, once their bodies died, they would feed bears and other animals. Their rotting carcasses would feed and, and, and uh, would feed flies. Then those flies would be eaten by insects and other animals their rotting carcasses would actually decompose and provide nutrients to the soil. So the annual migration of eels and salmon were an important nitrogen pulse for the, for the, for the rainforest, for, sorry, for the forests which existed around those lakes and river systems. 
um, what they were doing over in South America um, was actually with permanent fish. They were growing, they, they would build up these uh, chinampets, um, which were essentially floating gardens out in the middle of lakes. And they would stock those lakes or those bodies of water would, with fish. So the fish would either eat the marine plants and their waste would get broken down and then used by plants, or they'd eat um, other fish or pest insects, and then they would transform that into fertilizer for the plants. So the farmer would come along and they would rake um, water onto their gardens to water and also fertilize their gardens. A quite common practice over in, in Asia is to combine rice farming with fish. So for example, the Siamese fighting fish, it was actually its original purpose was to, to swim amongst rice paddies and hunt out mosquito larvae and other pest insects, eat them, and their waste would then be broken down and then utilised by the plants. So humans all around the world have been really quite clever in understanding how different organisms work with one another, in this case fish and plants, how they work with one another and insert themselves into that equation either to harvest directly the fish, the eels and the salmon, or to utilise that exist pre-existing relationship to actually um, incorporate into their agriculture. So when you think about it, salmon and eel migrations, they are really responsible for building those great big redwood forests of, of North America, of, of fertilising the forests here in Australia because all of their dead bodies provided those important, important nutrients which those forests relied upon. And more recent studies have actually found um, through overfishing, through building of dams, the redwood forests of North America are actually suffering because they're not getting that annual layer of, that, uh, that annual pulse of nitrogen which helps fertilise the soil and keeps those forests strong. Radio. let's turn our attention now to the next learning objective, which is describe the tenets of the cell theory. Now, that video that you can see there is, is a great YouTube clip. I highly recommend that you do watch it at some stage because it describes the key people who are involved in the development of the cell theory. Radio. so let's talk about the cell theory now. So the cell theory states that all living things are composed of cells. Cells are the basic unit of life. Now, me personally, um, as a biologist, I kind of disagree with that part of the definition, but that's the cell theory. And my personal opinion is not really important in this instance, but let's just go with the definition that, that to be classified as life, you must be made of cells. Let's just go with that, okay? so. All cells, so sorry, all living things, all organisms are composed of one or more cells, but more importantly, composed of one or more cells and their products. And what we mean by products are things like skin and hair and teeth and nails. They are all products, or horns um, are also products of cells because they are part of us as an organ organism. And the third tenet of the cell theory is that cells are produced by the division or by splitting of pre-existing cells. So we can't get cells just spontaneously uh, appearing out of nowhere. They always must have come from pre-existing cells. That's the classification. Okay? Now, when we have a look at the levels of biological organization, you can see here, it's kind of addressing that last one there. If all, all cells are produced by a division of pre-existing cells, well, where do those pre-existing cells come from? Well, that is one of the, the key mysteries within biology is that we don't truly understand when was that point when non-life became life? That when did the first cell appear out of nothing, well, um, w without there being a pre-existing cell. And there's a lot of really exciting work being done in this area, looking at molecules which are able to replicate by themselves in the absence of cells. So there's a whole range of candidates of what we think 
might be going on, a hypothesis of what, what we of how life came to be, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah. So when we look at this divide between what's life and non-life, well, it can be summarized in that diagram that we can see here. So when we have a look at the branches of science, so geology, physics, chemistry, and biology, we pretty much divide up the natural world into different areas. So physics, they look at the matter, uh, they look at energy and motion. Chemistry, obviously they look at chemicals. L um, biology, on the other hand, we look at life. And we look at life on a whole variety of scales. So not just down at the cellular level, but we look at life even all the way up at the biosphere level. And let's talk about that. So where the distinction between living and non-living is, is that field, which is my field, of biochemistry. Um, so biochemists, they d study the chemistry of life. Okay? Now, when we look at biology proper, we can look at either cells, so you might be a cytologist, um, and then cells are organized into things called tissues. So for example, we might have skin, we might have muscle, we might have bone. If you combine another number of different types of tissues, then we have things called organs. So for example, your stomach is made up of muscle and skin, for example. And so therefore, you might be a gastrologist because you study the stomach. Those various organs, they combine together into what we call systems or organ systems. So for example, the respiratory system is a bunch of organs which work together to provide uh, for, for gas exchange and, and transport within your body. Um, so if you get a bunch of organ systems together, then you have what's called an organism. If you get a number of organisms together of the same type, then you have a population. So it might be a population of tigers, might be a population of koalas, might be a population of humans. If you get a number of populations together, then you have what's known as a community. And then if you have a number of communities together, they form an e ecosystem. And then when you have a look at all of the ecosystems on the earth together as a whole, then what you're looking at there is the biosphere. So biology is organized on a ver whole variety of levels all the way down to the cellular level and all the way up to the biosphere level. And, sci and biologists, we kind of split the work up into some people will look at just cells, some people will look, look at just organs, other people will look at ecosystems, other people will look at populations. But um, nonetheless, biology is organized in quite a clear leveling like this, from the cellular level all the way up to the biosphere. So here is an activity for you. In relation to this learning objective, describe the structure and function of human organ systems, what I want you to, to do is to choose one of the organ systems that you can see there on the screen. So you might choose a urinary system, reproductive system, um, skeletal system, integumentary system, the endocrine, it doesn't matter what system you choose, just choose one. And what I'd like you to do is to create the graphic organizer which has this general structure. So just copy and paste this into another document. And then, then what I'd like you to do is to identify for you, to identify the organs of that particular system. Okay? Now, when it comes to the digestive system that you can see on the board there, it kind of makes sense to list things from the mouth going all the way through the anus in, in that organ column. However, in other systems, it doesn't really matter what order you put those in, okay? So choose a system, and then what I'd like you to do is to create the, the backbone of this particular template, so you then have a resource. What I'll do to this PowerPoint, which sits in the Google Drive, is I will recreate this slide, so as you do this activity, you can actually do it within that PowerPoint, so then as a whole cohort, you'll have a whole bunch of these graphic organizers all ready to go when it comes time for you to teach about the various human organ systems. Okie dokie. Radio. Let's turn our attention now to homeostasis. So homeostasis is from, I, I, the, the, the name for the study of homeostasis is physiology. So if you're a physiologist, you actually study how the body works and how, in particular, how the body maintains 
homeostasis. That is maintaining a constant level, or well, thereabouts, for a whole variety of things. So for example, we need to be able to control our temperature. We don't want it to get too hot. We don't want it to get too cold. Um, we want to regulate the amount of oxygen, the, well, the ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide in our bloodstream. Too much oxygen is bad. Too little oxygen is bad. There is a sweet spot somewhere in the middle that there is a system within your body designed to maintain your blood oxygen level within a narrow range, your blood glucose within a narrow range, your temperature within a narrow range, because when you move beyond that range, then it can spell disaster for you as an organ system. So one of the key ways that homeostasis works is through a process called a negative feedback loop. And it's that diagram, it's that part of the diagram that you can see there on the left. So let's have a look at temperature control as an example. So your body receives a stimulus from the external environment or the internal environment about the thing that it's in charge of regulating, in this case, body temperature. So for example, you've gone for a ride or you've gone for a run and get, your body's getting really hot, you're overheating, or you might have an infection and your body is going through a fever. Actually, let's not do fever because that's an example of a positive feedback loop. So ignore that I said fever. And let's come back to um, having gone for a run. Rodeo, in the process of going for a run, your mitochondria are burning glucose like crazy. It's producing a whole lot of heat that your body needs to get rid of. Well, that heat is actually detected by a, 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 a uh, temperature sensor at the bottom of the carotid artery, which is just about here, yeah, um, where it splits into two. Um, and there's a little sensor there and it detects temperature and it relays the information directly to your brain. So that little temperature sensor has detected, oh, Harry's getting really hot. We need to bring the temperature down. So it sends a signal to the part of your brain responsible for temperature regulation and it, 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 uh, it signals the alarm bell. So the alarms go off and say, and it says, uh oh, we're too hot. We need to start to cool down. That control center within your brain then sends a signal to other parts of your body called the effectors for them to do something. So one of the things that you can do is breathe in more, in, breathe in and out more heavily. So one of your main organs of heat exchange is not just your skin, but also your lungs. So that's, that's a great way of regulating your body temperature. The other way of regulating your body temperature is by are sweating. Okay? So by you secreting sweat onto the surface of your skin, a light breeze comes along and it helps that, um, that, that, that layer of sweat evaporate and that, take, that takes the heat away from it, um, from your skin. Also, you can influence the higher parts of your brain. So it can moderate your behavior. So it can make you seek out shade, for example. It can make you stop running, for example. Um, if we were dogs, one of the, our mechanisms for regulating our body temperature would be to pant more. So hang our tongue out and breathe in and out more often. If we were kangaroos, what we would do is we would actually lick our forearms and then have that, that the cooling, um, ha have that as a radiator to radiate heat away from our, uh, our bodies. Um, th th there's a breed of rabbit in Africa which once, if it gets too hot, it will pump more blood through these massive ears that it has on top of its head, and their purpose is to radiate heat away from our body. So, once the effector has actually kicked in, then it will create a new stimulus by either being effective or ineffective, and it goes around in the loop. And we call it a negative feedback loop because the effect of the sensor, the control, and the effector is to dampen down or reduce the, um, it, it is to counteract that move away from the middle. So effectors can either um, ha, uh, increase our temperature, show for example shivering and goosebumps and, and huddling and, um, and, and causing us to go and put on warm clothing. They can actually bring up our temperature.
or we can actually dampen down our temperature as the example for when we're sweating. Okay? Radio, let's move on to some genetics. And in this case, particular Mendelian genetics. Now, Gregor Mendel was a uh, priest and he was a keen gardener. And, and he particularly loved peas. And, and one of the, the things that he as a pre-breeder was interested in was, wow, when I grow these peas, why do they come out in all these different um, colors, for example? Why are some yellow? Why are some green? He also noticed that when he looked at his uh, pea plants, that some were tall and some were short. Some had wrinkled peas, some had round peas. Some had white flowers, some had violet flowers. Okay? So he, he found that, that his pea plants varied, um, that they were different. And, 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 and so as humans, we, we kind of understood that characteristics were passed from parents to offspring, but we didn't really understand the mechanism for how that worked or, or what was actually being passed down. So for a long time, it was assumed that characteristics were passed down through the blood. And, and that's where we got a lot of our language from in terms of inheritance, in, in terms of bloodlines and things like that. Okay? So, so Mendel, he grew a whole heap of plants, again and again, uh, pea plants, again and again and again. And he was the one that actually figured out how, well, in this particular instance, in peas, um, how characteristics were passed from the parents to the offspring and how by looking at the, the, um, the characteristics of the parents, their genotype and their phenotype, how you could actually work out the genetic makeup of the offspring and also what that would look like. So through all of his work, he came up with three laws. Okay? So when Mendel did his work, he just happened to stumble upon characteristics were, which were either dominant or recessive. Now, genetics is a little bit more complicated than that, but his original work was just restricted to characteristics which were dominant or recessive. Okay? And he defined a characteristic as dominant if that if when it's present, it always appears. Whereas if a characteristic was recessive, that it only appears when both of the factors, as he called them back then, were present. Okay? And so that's where he came up with the law of dominance, that, that within genes, these things which carry the information from one generation to the next, that there are some characters which are dominant or always present, and there are other characters which are recessive, which are only visible in terms of phenotype if you have both of the factors. The other thing that he realized was that, that that offspring get characteristics from both parents. It's not just from mom and it's not just from dad. And, and, and he built that into his series of laws. And he also realized that, um, that, that there are two more ideas. Those are of segregation and also independent assortment. So let's talk about independent assortment first. So independent assortment means that when you have a look at the genetic makeup of the uh, parents, in this case, then there's a 50-50 chance of the genes going from 